Hello and howdy to each one of you out there. My name is Tom, my wife is Juliana, and we have a wonderful show for you here. You really don't want to miss it. You see, we're on our way to the wild west town of Dodge City. It's kind of a three-day weekend thing for us. Dodge City has been called the queen of cow towns and the cowboy capital. It has rodeos, music and dancing, even trolley tours and a water park. But it's not all fun and games here. We've been warned that there's a spooky cemetery in the middle of town called Boot Hill, home of the hangman's tree. It gets worse though. We've also been hearing about a skeleton that walks around, a ghost, even a haunted house. What's happening here? We may be in some real trouble here. People say it's time to get out of Dodge. Well, guess what? We're not leaving. We're staying here to solve this mystery. It's one of the greatest ghost stories of the Old West. We're going to get to the bottom of it. We're hoping you can come along, too. It begins right now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Dodge City, a small town on the plains of western Kansas. Dodge City is, of course, known as the centerpiece town of the Old West. It was founded in 1872 to be a thirst-quenching oasis for stagecoach travelers on the wide-open frontier. But it quickly became known for its cowboys, saloons, and gunfights. In fact, some of the greatest battles of Western history took place right here on Front Street Road, right in front of the Long Branch Saloon. And these legends made it to the pages of dime store novels and children's comic books, which have excited readers the world over. The happenings of Little Dodge became a mainstay of American culture in the television era. The hit series Gunsmoke shared the weekly adventures of Marshal Matt Dillon, his finicky sidekick Festus, and the dance hall owner Miss Kitty Russell. For 20 years, from 1955 to 1975, thrilled audiences tuned in to watch Matt Dillon try to defend the tiny town from a sandstorm of lawbreakers and highway bandits. The TV show was based on an overlapping radio program of the same name, making it the longest-running western in primetime history. And in 1987, the original cast made a triumphant reunion in the classic made-for-TV movie, Gunsmoke, Return to Dodge. Dodge City has set the scene for several motion pictures over the years, including the 1939 epic Dodge City, starring Errol Flynn, and also from 1936, the movie Dodge City Trail, featuring Charles Starlet as leading man. Some more films you may have heard of are Gunfight at Dodge City, which tells the story of gentleman hero Bat Masterson, who comes to town to help his brother fight against the evil gangs of the area. There's also the 1941 classic King of Dodge City, in which Wild Bill Hickok teams up with Tex Ritter to take on a group of outlaws. And you don't want to miss 1954's Masterson of Kansas, the story of Bat Masterson's greatest detective case, when a local Native American chief named Yellowhawk tips him off the cattle rustlers are claiming to frame local hero Wyatt Earp for crimes he did not commit. There's also new modern classics, like the award-winning 1994 Kevin Costner biopic Wyatt Earp, a four-hour-long unraveling of the legendary man, and the 2012 direct-to-video movie Wyatt Earp's Revenge, in which the gunslinger recruits his former boss, Sheriff Bill Tillman, and barkeeper Charlie Bassett, in a posse on a hunt for justice after the Dodge City singer and stage actress Dora Hand was gunned down by a jealous audience member on the night of October 4th, 1878. You may have noticed the storytelling of Dodge City mostly revolves around three people. First of all, there's Wyatt Earp, a fearless lawman who walked tall in the city streets, a symbol of justice and order. Then there's Doc Holliday, a dentist by trade and a gambler by night. 
Wyatt Earp met him at a poker table, and the two became instant inseparable friends. Although they appeared to be on different sides of the law, they shared many common enemies around town, and so an uneasy alliance began, which over the years came to be one of the greatest friendships of all time. Another one of their allies was Bat Masterson, a well-groomed man dressed all in black with a bowler hat and gentleman's walking stick. Although Masterson was an expert with a pistol, he preferred to fight his battles with haberdashery and clever mind games. In his later years, it said he even used his cane like a sword to sword fight against his foes. Between the years of 1876 and 1879, these three heroes managed to keep a fragile semblance of peace in what the New York newspapers called the wickedest place on earth. Until finally, the forces of evil so greatly outnumbered them that Wyatt Earp's wife implored him to get out of Dodge before it was too late. Wyatt, along with his family, fled Dodge City for Tombstone, Arizona, on a cold winter's day of 1879. Shortly afterward, Doc Holliday and Bat Masterson departed by stagecoach to meet him there. And so ended the legendary Dodge City Days. Later in the 20th century, Dodge City was reinvented and became a major tourist attraction as Western-themed books, TV, and movies exploded into pop culture. Did you know that the tiny town of Dodge receives around 100,000 visitors annually, including for the summertime's Dodge City Days, a rodeo and country music festival held in the city streets. Other tourist attractions include the Kansas Cowboy Hall of Fame, Gunsmoke Avenue, where many famous cowboys have stars on the Trail of Fame, and also the Dodge House Hotel, where Doc Holliday himself resided. Also, there is the Great Western Hotel, where travelers the world over arrived by stagecoach. And next door is the Long Branch Saloon, where Doc and Wyatt would sit and play cards all hours of the night. Directly behind the saloon and hotel is the infamous Boot Hill Cemetery, where villains were tossed into their graves, boots and all. Atop this dreaded hill are the remains of the Hanging Tree, a pillar of wood where many evildoers came to their wicked end. You may think that this is the spookiest thing you'll ever see here in Little Dodge, but right here in this vicinity there is one ghost story so terrifying it still invokes nightmares and chases away visitors to this day. It's called the Haunted House of Dodge City. The legend goes thusly. Back in 1877, right next door to the Great Western Hotel sat a house. The residence of a Mr. and Mrs. John McGinty, a respectable and fairly well-off couple of the town, the quiet house and the McGinty's themselves always seemed ordinary enough until one day the strangest thing happened. Mrs. McGinty was talking to her husband John when all of a sudden, in mid-sentence, her eyes got as big as dinner plates and she dropped over dead like she had just seen a specter from another realm. Well, poor Mr. McGinty took this loss pretty hard and the townspeople felt sorry for him. But when they stopped by after the funeral to comfort him, they discovered that John McGinty had vanished. People going missing here and there is not unheard of, but here is what is baffling. McGinty did not own a horse, and the only other realistic ways to depart from Dodge City are by train or stagecoach and the stable man and the depot man attested that they never saw McGinty at all and he certainly never bought a ticket. The strange disappearance of John A. McGinty has never been solved. In the months that followed, the abandoned home of Mr. and Mrs. McGinty became known as a spooky abode of bats and owls 
And according to the Dodge City Times Gazette, some people would not walk past it. And the fear of it even kept young boys indoors at night. It had become known as a haunted house. Then came the events of Monday, January 28, 1878. It was a dark and stormy night, and three men traveling by coach tried to find shelter at the Great Western Hotel, which unfortunately was completely full. And so the men escaped the rain and lightning by shuffling into the Long Branch Saloon. Inside the saloon, the three road weary and dripping wet companions a prizefighter named Kinch Riley, a horseman named James Dalton, and a small-time politician named H.T. McCarty inquired about the possibility of finding a bed for the night. The cowboys at the bar told them that the town's hotels were full. However, there was an empty house next door, but it was too scary for anyone to enter, let alone spend the night. What do you mean too scary, said Dalton, the horseman. The men at the bar then recounted the fateful story of the McGinty's tragedy and how people walking by the empty house often would hear whispers and groans coming from the pitch black darkness inside. The three traveling companions laughed out loud at this notion and accepted the challenge. Late that night, as they prepared for bed, the three men agreed that the house indeed did have a strange sense to it, but assured themselves that all was well. And so the three locked arms, said their good nights to each other, and entered into a sweet slumber. But a couple of hours later, one of the men, Riley, was awoken when he slowly felt cold and clammy fingers brush against his face. A few seconds later, as lightning lit up the skies, he saw, standing upright in the corner, a skeleton! With a huge grin on its face, Riley was paralyzed with fear. He tried to scream, but nothing came out. A few moments later, H.T. McCarty also awoke and went to investigate a creak he heard. And suddenly he saw a figure standing atop the balcony, dressed all in white, which he assumed to be the deceased Mrs. McGinty. Fair demon, he spoke, ghost of the departed, why sittest thou like an enemy in wait here watching at the head of those who sleep? Immediately afterwards, James Dalton also woke up and saw down the dark hallway a floating ball of light, illuminated like fire, and it was coming closer and closer, until Dalton finally screamed. The three men quickly opened a window as fast as they could and dove into the giant mud puddle outside. As the trio stood together in the wind and rain, they recomposed themselves, agreed that they must have imagined the whole thing, and collecting their courage, they walked over to the front door of the house and carefully peeked back inside. Among the dark shadows inside, it seemed that they could make out a faint white light. But Dalton said the ball of light that scared him was orangey. And this, on the other hand, appeared to be a sheer white color. It was then they realized. They weren't looking at a ball of light. They were looking at Mrs. McGinty's mirror above her bureau, reflecting the ghostly figure in white standing right next to the front door. As thunder boomed, the three men ran all the way screaming back to the Long Branch Saloon and recounted these terrible events to everyone at the bar. Now, you may be wondering if all this was induced by nightmares. However, that's simply unrealistic. That three grown men, a boxer, a horseman, and a public official all had the same delirium that night. On February 2nd, 1878, the Dodge City Times published their account of these fantastic events, and it quickly spread to other newspapers too, all across America. 
the tale of Dodge City's haunted house. And in the 145 years that followed, it has become one of the most legendary unsolved cases in paranormal history. And now this weekend, we'll be going on a trip to Dodge City to do some exploring of our own and see what we can find out. Tonight, we'll be staying at the Dodge House Hotel and investigating any mysteries that may be there. We'll also be visiting the Great Western Hotel, which is a tourist center now, and it's also the entrance to the Boot Hill Cemetery and Museum. And along the way, we may also stop at the Long Branch Saloon for potato chips and Pepsi. Yes, I think we have a big day ahead. And so we better get started. And we're hoping you and the audience can come along too. Well, everyone, here we are, walking down Wyatt Earp Boulevard in Dodge City. This is where it all happened. Imagine being here in the legendary days of the Old West. You see vultures circling in the sky. A tumbleweed rolls by. You can hear horseshoes trotting down the street. And the air smells of mesquite from a wood stove. Then, all of a sudden, two men in ten-gallon hats step out to the dusty road. You can see their steel-plated pistols glint and glimmer in the scorching sun. Then one of them shouts out, Draw, partner! A lot of people ask me, Tom, what is your obsession with Wild West? I tell them, well... Let's just say I love it when the good guys win. That's what it's all about for me. No, but seriously, nothing we see around us would even be here if it wasn't for these guys. If not for these battles, this is how the West was won. And I love this story. But today we're here to solve a ghost story. And we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of research to do. I think it's a good idea right now to stop in one of these cantinas here for a couple of tacos. What? I need to stop for lunch. But we have a, a wonderful place here. It's called El Rodeo, which has been recommended to us. Great chips and salsa we've heard. I think we should stop for a couple of tacos and do some game planning for today's investigation. We'll have a couple of tacos, get the notebook out, and get down to business. Well, these are the facts as we know them. In 1878, the Dodge City newspaper reported that three strangers traveling together saw a skeleton, a ghost, and a floating ball of light. Now, these things seem imaginary. However, it seems so unlikely that Three people traveling together would make up the same story on the same night. If you're wondering about the haunted house, it doesn't exist anymore. We know where the house is located. It's right next door to the Long Branch Saloon and right in between the Great Western Hotel, which would put it directly south of the cemetery may have something to do with it. So we're definitely going to be visiting the cemetery, the Great Western, which is a tourist shop now. And we're also wanting to go to the Long Branch Saloon. The good news is that all three of these are located in the Boot Hill Museum complex. This queso blanco is insanely good. And I see you have a very innovative menu item there. Hey. Plenty of avocado on that. I see you went straight for the lime squeeze on that too. Okay, I got Hey, I'm gonna go crazy on this burrito. This, this is my kind of one. Well, before we get today's investigation started, we better check into our room here at the Dodge House Hotel and Convention Center and Buffet Restaurant, centrally located right here on Wyatt Earp Boulevard. This hotel used to be a Holiday Inn back in the 1980s, but now it's been renamed and redecorated 
in the legacy of the original Dodge House, which was Dodge City's largest hotel in the 1880s. Oh my goodness, look at that! There's a glass door on the side of the building that's been shattered. There must have been a brawl between some rowdy cowpokes. Well, no, I'm just kidding. The door is facing west, so I think I know what happened. The wind did something to it. It's been trying to knock us over all day. Did you know that Dodge City is actually the windiest place in America? The official record of the town with the most sustained wind is Dodge City. And trust me, after you've been here a couple of hours, you start to notice. We went around the corner and it almost knocked us over. Yeah, it's like 50 miles an hour. Kidding. My first winter here, the wind was going at 62 miles an hour. And we only had like this much snow on the ground. You couldn't see the street out there. They had everything shut down and they told people that if people out there and you get stuck, you're on your own. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was that bad. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you literally, you couldn't see the end of the building. Wow. Oh, man. It must have been a wide out. Yeah. I mean, you can get only two or three inches of snow, but it was wind. Yeah, we went around that corner and that wind just yeah, almost took us out. Over it will. That's why that door broke down on that end. Yeah, we noticed that. It literally ripped it off the brain. That's what we said. I said that must have been a wind event. Those paintings and stuff that's uh -huh. looking back here and those over there um, are done by Ingo Gala. She did most of the decorating here. And that oh, wow. That's who? Her dad is a guy that James Arnett shot at the beginning of every show at the end of the street. <gasps> oh! And she did the painting here, and some of the wood that's out there on the gun smoke room out there, that general store, is from the original gun smoke set. So this is the man from the opening credits of yep. gun smoke that gets so shot. Arnett, yeah. Him every day. Very famous opening credits. Yep. In fact, I think I might have one of those quilters left. Oh wow! <laughs> oh neat! Oh wow! Oh cool! If you don't want it, that's okay too, but it's a lot of You know what? I bet some cowboy is going to come in that this would mean a lot she has too. Dwarf. Oh, she does? Yeah, if you don't want it, she just drops some off to to give away. Oh, in scared. that case, I'll, I'll hang on to this. But, but, uh, his daughter, she grew up on the Gunsmoke set. And she did this painting. She did most of the decorating here, the decorating in the restaurant, and she did those paintings down the Oh, hallway. that is incredible. She did all that. Huge Gunsmoke connection. Yeah, and that breakfast area has signed autographs from Gunsmoke. Stars out in it. They had oh, cool. And this guy that's on the post board, uh -huh. his name is Charlie Lee. He's still an active federal marshal. He's 84 to 85 next month. He just got inducted into the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Aww. You know, we were just at the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Yep, and he was born here on Gravel Road, delivered by the first federal marshal out here in Dodge City by the name of Hamilton Bell. Really? He was delivered as a baby? Yeah, his mom couldn't make the hospital when he was born in the first horseless carriage ambulance slash hers on the ground world. Oh, wow. Two years later, he became a federal marshal. This is not the original Dodge House. Um, the original Dodge House burned, and it was downtown across from Lewis Motors. Oh, wow. Yeah, in 1872. And then this was built in the 70s, and then it was a holodome, and then in 88, it became the Dodge House. And the original Dodge House was just a wood shack. Oh, really? <laughs> and, it turned, and it was downtown, yep, on Front Street. As we saw some old photos of the original Dodge mm -hmm. House. Yep, there's Miss Kitty, the original oh. Miss Kitty. You can have that photo if you want. Oh, thank you. Miss Inga Gugala, she keeps up on all that stuff for us. Oh, wow. Yep. Thank you so much. Did you want us to hang on to this? Yeah, you can have that. We have a whole bunch of those. And this is the original Miss Kitty. That's the real Miss Kitty. This looks a lot like Marilyn, doesn't she? That's what she I does. was thinking. Yep. She wow. looks a lot like Marilyn. We have a bunch of these upstairs that we just found. Buffalo Bill Cody yes. and Wild Bill Hickok. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of those. I found them in a closet upstairs. The pictures that you see in the shadow boxes, like down down the hallway uh -huh. over here, that has a lot of the history and stuff in it, too. Oh, wow. The daughter of the man who was shot in the opening credits yep. of Gunsmoke. Yep. And did she paint these or just arrange them? No, she painted. She painted these. Yeah, we have pictures of her painting them. You can go on her website, Ingo Gall. It's amazing painting. There's a little mall up there. She has a antique. She has a store up there. You know, I think we may have even seen that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's her. Blonde, busty lady, very outgoing. We almost thought about stopping there, okay. but we. She's a neat lady. Put her on here. Right. You need to come during Dodge City Days, which oh. is the last week of July and first week of August, and we grow to about 140,000. Wow! wow. <laughs> we have, we have a pro rodeo, one of the biggest pro rodeos in the world here during that time. They, they do the reenactment of the shootout and everything. 
Oh, I would enjoy that. Yeah. Well, let's check out the hotel room here. See what we got. Oh, I'm excited. Begin exploring here. A little windy though. The wind has gotten a bit crazy. Here we go, we'll see if we can activate this. And here we are. And I think we got it, cool. Hey, we'll just turn on some lights here. Great place to watch TV, we have all the channels. Yes! Hey, we might turn on some Western movies this evening. You bet. Boom, boom, pow, pow. And um, we have the re refrigerator freezer. This is gonna come in handy. Hey, if we want to uh, warm up some vittles. I'm just kidding. And we have the king bedroom here. Oh wow, the door got punched. <gasps> the door got punched. Yeah, someone got drunk. Oh wow, somebody punched the door. Hey, this is the Wild West. I know you're interested in hitting the swimming pool. Right next to there is a video game area where I can play some arcade games. I think they also have a, a, a candy and soda area where I can get some concessions. And I know that you... Whoa! <laughs> we have a ghost light here. Uh, some strange happenings here in the hotel already. No, I'm just kidding about that. Oh, cool. Oh, I'm jumping on that pool table. Oh, Miss Pac-Man, yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think of doing first? The video games or the swimming pool? Hey, not a bad idea. <laughs> Oh wow, they have, yes, they have a baby size one. And I know you're looking for the diving board right now. <laughs> oh, hey. Oh, is it chilly or warm? Okay, good. Hey. Hey, it looks like you have the whole, whole pool to yourself, wow. <laughs> hey, it looks like you are ready to lounge by the pool. Good thing I brought lots of quarters because I'm gonna knock out the video games. Hey, great idea, you're jumping on the hot water now. Neat. Going to the jacuzzi, huh? Cool. I've got some work to do. Cruising USA, yes, yes! And they have an exercise room upstairs. What I love about the wreck area of the Dodge House is the recreation of the general store here in the pool area. And this is actually the continental breakfast area. So in the morning, you just come here. They have everything, cereal, biscuits and gravy, waffles. And you also have access to the second floor from up here. And this is called the Bull's Head Saloon. This is where you can sit down with your Cheerios. Love the Dodge House Hotel. And we love this rec room. You can even play volleyball here. They have a volleyball net. Ah! They even have ping pong over here. And a basketball court. Cruising Exotica. Oh, wow. They are going to get a lot of quarters from me today. Oh, I can't wait to jump in this. Yes! Oh, yeah! We're talking about some high-speed adventure here. Oh, look at this, Galaga! Atari Site 4. That's for blasting aliens. Wow, looks like that hot tub is really working out for you, by the way. Oh, wow! I want to climb the staircase next. Oh, boy. Oh, I love going up this. Yes, this is wonderful for the investigation, being able to come up to all levels. Oh, there's a third level up here. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll just climb up here. More investigating to do. Boy, you could almost make a big splash. Just jump over the rail and go down here. I don't know. Maybe it's not a great idea. We'll see. And now we're continuing our investigation down this corridor here. And we're on the top level of the General Store and Bullshead Saloon, also known as the Dodge House uh, Breakfast Area. We may have to do an investigation here later tonight. Right now we're monitoring the situation from up here. Wow, you know what, if you take a running jump, 
You could almost make it into the pool. Well, no, I better not try. Well, here we are now at the Great Western Hotel Gift Shop and Tourist Center, which is also the entrance to the Boot Hill Cemetery and Museum. And we're ready to begin our investigation today. It's great here. You just walk through the souvenir shop and they'll give you a map, tell you where to go. You just go out the back door and begin exploring museum grounds. The restored version of a mini 1870s Dodge City front street. This is so much fun. You may be wondering, are any of the buildings we see here today the originals? The answer is no. The original Dodge City was destroyed in a huge fire in 1885. The buildings you see today were very faithfully recreated beginning in the 1950s to attract lots of vacationers during the Western TV craze. The closest thing to an original is the town jail, which is actually the disused and forgotten jail from Fort Dodge. They found it and decided just to move it over to the grounds here. Also in the museum, you will see many authentic items like guns, arrowheads, and many artifacts like that. You may also be wondering if Boot Hill is a real cemetery. The answer is yes and no. The actual burial grounds are on the other side of the hill. And over here on this side, they have a pretend cemetery. It's just for fun. Look, this is a place for families. They don't want anyone to feel bad. And people have picnics and, and, and things like that here. So it's all just for play. And here on Boot Hill, you will see tombstones. They seem to be a mixture of real people and made up people along with funny stories about how they met their demise. Cute things like, oh, they fell off a cliff, or something like that. I will say I'm starting to notice that people here in Dodge City seem to have a weird sense of humor. Here we have a map of Dodge City that was given to us by the gift shop with instructions of where we're needing to investigate. We filled them in on uh, our mission that we're working on. They say it's quite a case. Right up this ramp is where you go to Boot Hill Cemetery. And Tom, why are you holding that <laughs> bridge already? Ignore this, ignore what's happening. Now we have two options here. The stairs going downward leads to Front Street, which we need to investigate. By the way, I know that this isn't the haunted house now, but Wow, this is just the first thing I thought. While visiting the Boot Hill Museum, we learned that Old West Dodge City was surrounded by Native American tribes, namely the Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches. And while some Old West natives were friendly, these tribes were extremely dangerous. And part of the reason travelers on the Santa Fe Trail had to move in wagon trains because of the constant reality of a surprise attack. Western Kansas was also once home of the Cheyenne people. And this is told in the 1964 Western saga, Cheyenne Autumn, which is set near Dodge City. The movie which stars Jimmy Stewart as Wyatt Earp and Arthur Kennedy as Doc Holliday is based on the true story of when the Cheyenne tribe escaped from their reservation in 1878 and tried to return to their buffalo hunting grounds. But what they didn't know is that the U.S. Army had already begun massacring the buffalo herds, thus cutting off their food supply and ending the Great War for the West. Fort Dodge is a small outpost southeast of town which still exists today. It was once the fortress of George Armstrong Custer, famous for the Battle of Little Bighorn. Dodge City is actually named for the fort, and in the 1860s and 70s, it was used by the U.S. Cavalry assigned to repel attacks against covered wagons on their way across the wild frontier. The Santa Fe Trail was a charted path from Kansas to New Mexico used by pilgrims and merchants in the mid-1800s, and it went right past Dodge City. You can still see the wagon ruts outside of town today. The train tracks of the Old West also came right through Dodge City. And this is what brought many of the cattle and cowboys to town. On the far side of Boot Hill Cemetery, there's a statue called the Campfire Cowboy with the inscription of a desperado regaled in chaps and spurs 
who extinguished his campfire by dumping out his coffee and saying, on the ashes of this campfire, my city will be built. Another famous cowboy with a marker nearby is Ham Bell, the Dodge City Marshal credited with finally civilizing the town around the turn of the century. His career spanned from the 1870s all the way to the 1940s. We also learned at the hotel he delivered as a baby the future Marshal of Dodge City still serving into the 21st century. Amazing to think that these two men with an overlapping connection both wore the 10 star badge of Dodge from the days of the Old West all the way to the era of cell phones. Ham Bell, along with other lawmen like Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson, are honored with monuments around town. But of course, the most famous statue, located in front of the visitor center, is none other than the towering figure of Marshal Matt Dillon. The fictional gunslinger played by James Arness in what was television's number one show from 1957 to 1961. Did you know that John Wayne was originally intended to star in the show, but instead he recommended his friend Arness for the part? John Wayne also filmed a brief intro for episode one of the series. Gunsmoke was the longest running entertainment show in American history at one point until The Simpsons came along. And Arnest starred in every single episode, all 635 of them. And he also returned for the made-for-TV movies in 1987, 1990, 92, 93, and 94. He never missed one entry of the series. Not even when suffering from pain and fatigue from his World War II injuries. That's right, Arnest didn't just pretend to be a tough guy. He was a former combat soldier awarded the Bronze Star and Purple Heart for his courage. Gunsmoke is the show which coined the popular phrase, time to get out of Dodge. The phrase connotates a looming sense of unstoppable fate and a short prescribed time to escape it. This originated from the Dodge City practice of scheduling a gunfight at high noon on Front Street and the chance to avoid it by fleeing town before it's too late. This western trope was used as the setup for the legendary 1968 Star Trek original series episode Spectre of the Gun, in which the Enterprise crew find themselves on a planet in outer space which simulates the Wild West. And they're scheduled to gunfight Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp with no way out. Great, great episode. Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Scotty all appeared on episodes of Gunsmoke as well, so a nice crossover there. Also, Harrison Ford from Star Wars appeared on Gunsmoke. <laughs> as a young person, he got punched and said his teeth fell out. A very young Kurt Russell also appeared in a 1974 episode of Gunsmoke. I'm sure without knowing that 20 years later, he would play Wyatt Earp in the iconic movie Tombstone crossing the universes of TV fiction and reality. Another thing I'm sure that people on Gunsmoke never imagined is that 20 years later they'd be electronic cartoons in a 1987 Nintendo game called Gunsmoke. That was based on an arcade game from Japan of all places. In England, Gunsmoke was rebranded as Gunlaw and ran as a comic strip there in the 1970s. In 1955, Dell Publishing released Gunsmoke comic books based on the TV show. And in 1959, Atlas Comics also came out with Gunsmoke comic books. Except this edition starred an all-new hero called Kid Colt. And in 1958, Gunsmoke the novel was brought to bookstores. Did you know that the actor who played Floyd the Barber on The Andy Griffith Show was the original Doc Adams from the Gunsmoke radio program and is seen in early promotional posters? And the actor Glenn Strange, who played the bartender on Gunsmoke, was also the Frankenstein monster in three universal horror flicks of the 1940s. When Glenn Strange passed away in 1974, it led to the actress who played Miss Kitty leaving the show. She tried to return to work but missed her friends so much that she just couldn't walk back into the saloon ever again. And she retired from the TV show, effective immediately. On the fictional show, Miss Kitty is the owner-operator of the Long Branch Saloon, 
but did you know it was a real saloon, not a made-up one for TV? And in the 1983 comedy movie National Lampoon's Vacation, Clark Griswold and his traveling family decide to visit the Long Branch Saloon while passing through Dodge City, only to discover it's a heavenly merchandise tourist trap, and his children find the cowboy actors to be quite silly. You may be surprised to know Gunsmoke was created from the popularity of a children's show. In the 1950s, The Lone Ranger was such a hit with kids that CBS decided to develop a grown-up version for adults. Nevertheless, the show has been tremendously popular with kids for decades and even became a trading card set in 1993. And in 2002 was inspiration for the Japanese manga space western Trigun the Planet Gunsmoke, which subsequently became an RPG board game. Yes, it appears the legend of Dodge City has spread across the globe and even to the planets of outer space and the realms of Dungeon Masters. Oh, wow! This is the Long Branch Saloon! I can't believe we're here! I gotta tell you, as far as historical locations of the Old West goes, nothing beats the Long Branch Saloon. These swinging doors on right here, it's so cool! Can you imagine being a cowboy jumping down from their horse? Getting your guns. I think if there's clues to be found, we better check right in here at the Long Branch Saloon. Let's go, buddy. And here's the cast of Gunsmoke visiting the Long Branch Saloon where we are standing now. And this stage is where they have weekend performances. Hey, I'd love a Pepsi! So our plan is next year anyway, just to level that out. Oh, cool. By the way, if you're wondering what's happening here, the town front is all interconnected on the inside, and you can walk through all the buildings like one large exhibit. The museum also has an interactive touchscreen system. If you want to get info on the Wild West, you just push the buttons. It even has a holographic barkeeper on the screens that follows you around the exhibit and guides you along the way. It's really quite a bit of fun. The faithful recreation of Dodge City Front Street includes the general store, an ice cream shop, the town jail, the Kansas Cowboy Hall of Fame, Beattie and Kelly's Country Style Dinner Hall, and of course, the Long Branch Saloon. Directly behind the museum, there's also the Boot Hill Distillery and the Dodge City Brewing Company. There's also an Applebee's if you need to stop and grab some french fries real quick. Well, that happens to me sometimes. Across the street from the Long Branch Saloon is the Long Branch Lagoon. A fun water park for the whole family. But of course, the central hub of activity in town, which is also located right in the center of town, is the Long Branch Saloon a welcoming, family-friendly venue with musical productions, comedy skits, gunfight reenactments, and stage and chorus shows. The saloon is adorned with photos of various local legends, like the baby-faced gunfighter Luke Short, who had his own comic book in the 1950s. Also, mysterious Dave Mather, a deputy marshal who got his nickname because he would never say anything to anyone. He would just stare at people until they left. Well, anyway, one day he disappeared and no one ever saw him again. There's also newspaper clippings from the Long Branch Saloon Shootout, also known as the Loving Richardson Gunfight, which occurred here on the night of April 5th, 1879, when a passing cowboy and a buffalo hunter exchanged pleasantries and then they pulled out their revolvers and began blasting the whole place to bits. But of course, the most fateful event that no one will ever forget is the night that stage actress Dora Hand was shot by a crazed admirer who was actually trying to shoot another one of her admirers and she was hit by mistake. They say that Bat Masterson, who also was an admirer of Miss Hand's, was never the same after this remembering all the coffins of villains that he carried to Boot Hill Cemetery. 
and now had the sad duty of placing this hand in hers. The rumor is he was heartbroken, but you would never know it because he would not compromise his coiffured and well-polished exterior image. Bat Masterson, famous for his black cane and gentleman's hat, actually wore many hats over the years. As a young man, he was a buffalo hunter and a U.S. Army scout, even a saloon keeper at one time. In fact, just like Wyatt Earp, he may have never even become a lawman, except to provide backup to his badge-wearing brothers. After leaving the Wild West, Bat Masterson returned to New York and spent the remainder of his years as a newspaper journalist covering the sport of prize fighting, which he loved. And he was friends with many boxers like Jack Dempsey and Gentleman Jim Corbett. He was even invited to the White House by fellow boxing enthusiast Theodore Roosevelt. And unlike most gunfighters of the West, he passed away peacefully at his newspaper desk surrounded by friends and colleagues in 1921. Masterson did not talk much about his days as a sheriff in Dodge City, although on one occasion when someone asked him what Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp were really like, he responded that Doc and Wyatt were the most feared men he had ever met. They were also the kindest men he had ever met. This trio of Western heroes finally reunited in a sort of way approximately 80 years later when all were starring on primetime TV programs. There was, of course, the Wyatt Earp show, which ran from 1955 to 1961, and The Adventures of Bat Masterson from 1958 to 1961. And in the 1950s and 60s, the characterized Doc Holliday made almost innumerable appearances on TV. Probably his most memorable escapade is on a four-episode serial of Doctor Who from 1966 called The Gunfighters, wherein the Doctor travels to the Wild West for a vacation, and Doc Holliday ends up switching identities with him and then running away, and leaves him in some real hot water. Yes, Doc Holliday was quite a fellow. Did you know that he was a dentist by trade? In fact, in the Boot Hill Museum, they have a dentist bag that was found among the personal effects of the former owner of the Long Branch Saloon. It's a leather bag inscribed Doc, and it's full of medical equipment. Apparently, Holiday did come to Dodge City to open a dental practice, but somewhere along the way, he abandoned this idea and turned completely to full-time gambling. Amazing to think that one of the most famous men of history was a dentist from a town with 900 people. The legend of Doc Holliday actually spread like wildfire in a peculiar way. Back in the early 1900s, a newspaper man was sitting at a bar in Golden, Colorado and started talking to an old traveling salesman who regaled him with various stories he had amassed over the decades. When asked if he knew any gunslingers from the Old West, he replied, Well, have you heard of Doc Holliday? He then proceeded to list off Holliday's many showdowns, standoffs, and daring escapes, which the journalist wrote down every word and published in his newspaper, and the story spread to other newspapers across the nation and even turned into a best-selling book. Later, the salesman admitted that he never actually knew Doc Holliday, but he knew of him. And he knew people who knew him, and he had heard these fantastic stories, and he believed them to be true. Well, what definitely was true about Doc was his unwavering loyalty to the Earp brothers, Wyatt in particular. And that's why he could not let them stand alone at the OK Corral. The greatest shootout of all time, which took place in Tombstone, Arizona on October 26, 1881, in which Virgil and Morgan Earp, Wyatt and Doc, took their stand against a rowdy group of unrepentant lawbreakers. The gun battle which took place on a dusty cattle ranch has come to embody everything it means to be a cowboy. Strength of a man's conviction, bound by honor, and never backing down from a fight. Wyatt later said that Doc saved his life on that day. Many historians believe he may have also saved Wyatt's life at the showdown with Johnny Ringo. After finding out that this villainous bushwhacker had challenged Wyatt to a duel, Doc jumped on his horse and rode as fast as he could to get there first and stand in his place. 
Unlike the vast majority of Old West gunslingers, Wyatt Earp lived to an old and happy age. And whereas Bat Masterson didn't like to talk about his Wild West past, Wyatt actually had quite a bit of fun with it. In the early 20th century, he moved to Hollywood, California and became an advisor on the sets of Western films during the silent movie era. He even became friends with the rhinestone cowboy Tom Mix. Wyatt loved seeing the cowboy life on the golden screen. And the greatest memorial of this came when the Library of Congress deemed historically significant and added to its archives the 1946 film My Darling Clementine, an enrapturing story of danger and romance on the wild frontier that was adapted from select chapters of Wyatt's biography. It's one of the great Western movies of all time. You can watch it for free on YouTube if you're interested. It really has that 1940s feel to it. We really recommend it. We think you're going to love it. And there's so many Western movies on YouTube for free. And the it seems like the older the better. Isn't that how that goes? Just, just sit down with some nachos this weekend and just turn on some of these great classic movies. You're going to be glad you did. Hey, we're here at the Kansas Teachers Hall of Fame, which also has a wax museum inside, if you can believe that. I don't know, some people though have said this place gives them nightmares. Well, everyone, we're now just outside of the Boot Hill Museum at what may be the scariest part of our investigation this weekend. This is the Kansas Teachers Hall of Fame and Gunfighter Wax Museum. Let me tell you, this place has a reputation of being spooky. Many people walking up the stairways and hallways of this building say they feel as though they're being watched. It could be the disturbing feeling of being stared at by Jesse James, Davy Crockett, and Calamity Jane. Honestly, walking the galleries of this museum feels like being in a hall of horrors. Especially when you see wax statues of the Wolfman. Frankenstein and Dracula attacking a poor cowboy at his campfire. You know, I can't stop thinking of Glenn Strange, who played the bartender on Gunsmoke, but then also played a monster in the movies House of Frankenstein, The House of Dracula, and also in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. It's startling that someone so kind and friendly on TV can just put on a costume and become so frightening you think it's Halloween. Well, one thing we learned at the Wax Museum was that cowboys standing around a campfire obviously were very superstitious to the point of even uh, tricking themselves into a sort of delirium with their ghost stories and so forth. Well, that place was quite a trip, wasn't it, Juliana? Juliana? Hey, where are you? Juliana, where are you? What is this? I didn't see. What did you, where, where did you go? Is this something I said? Why are you hiding from me? What? Is this a game? Is this about the potato chips? I know that at Long Branch Saloon, after I ate all my potato chips and Pepsi, I borrowed some of yours without asking. I saw that you shot me a dirty look. I didn't think you'd finish all of your chips. That's, that's all. I was worried about wasting food. You don't want me to waste food, did you? This is about the potato chips, isn't it? Look, I hope seeing those monsters at the wax museum didn't give you any crazy ideas. This is not how we act. Those monsters are just something from movies. Did your belt get hung up on a doorknob and you got stuck? Or... Where are you? Does it help if I say I'm sorry? I am sorry. I, I got confused. Your potato chips and mine look identical. 
I didn't know why you were all gone. I was just reaching around on the bed counter. Why are you doing this? Listen, I'm going to make a deal with you now. I will never take your chips again without checking first. Without asking, I won't do it. Please, come out. It was at this moment the thought occurred to me. What if the story of the haunted house is true? What if all of it is true? I don't know if I can take the suspense. Oh, oh got you. Oh, you scared the daylight donuts out of me. That's for my potato chips. You put me through all that to get even over some potato chips? I almost lost my wits because of you. I was this close to running out of here like I had seen a ghost. Oh boy. I have some things to think about. I think this is going to be a long night. And I believe the buggy is right this way. And I'm ready for dinner. I'm thinking steak. Oh, you bet my mind. <laughs> I'm thinking the first steakhouse we see will be... Hey, that works for me. And we're here at the Cowboy Capital Saloon and Grill. Wow! We have some wild drivers there. <laughs> You really gotta watch it uh, when you cross the street around here. Cool. Well, it's been an interesting weekend. Kind of a rough and tumble weekend, actually. Um, I think we need to talk about what happened last night. You scared me because you, uh, I'm not saying I did or didn't, but you say that oh. I took your potato chips at the Long Branch Saloon. Yes. And so you wanted revenge. And for payback, you tricked me into getting scared in the darkness of night. It's kind of an unfortunate event, but actually this put together the pieces of the puzzle for me. And I think we've solved the case, really. Here, here's my theory as I see it. And if I'm wrong, you know, type, type below, let me know. The McGinty's house, which became the haunted house, was right next to the Long Branch Saloon. And we visited the saloon, and we saw that it was pretty wild in there. Now, I know that the McGinty's were a respectable uh, couple from around town, but that may have just been their facade. I, it's a good story that Mrs. McGinty saw a ghost and, and then uh, just passed out. But I don't, I'm not sure that that's exactly what happened. I'm thinking that Mrs. McGinty was actually drinking booze and then fell down the stairs or fell off a balcony or something. I'm sorry, I just think that's what probably happened. Mr. McGinty, it's very sad, but I think that he also was drinking booze and then he wandered out of city limits. Now we learned at Boot Hill Museum that Dodge City in the 1870s was surrounded by hostile tribes like the Apaches, the Comanches, and the Kiowas. And I'm sorry, but I think Mr. McGinty got picked off because he was stumbling around uh, with a bottle of booze out in the desert. Or maybe he fell into some quicksand, or maybe he, or maybe a rattlesnake, who knows? He disappeared out in the desert, and that was the, uh, the McGinty's story. Now, regarding the night of the haunted house, here's what I think actually happened. It was a hoax, the same way that you hoaxed me at the Dodge House Hotel to get revenge for what happened in the bar. <laughs> at what we have learned during our visit in Dodge City. First of all, we learned that people in the Old West were very superstitious and they told campfire stories about ghosts. They're already predisposed to believe outrageous claims about ghosts and monsters and werewolves and things like that. Second of all, we learned that uh, people in saloons in particular, the, the Long Branch Saloon were a very rowdy bunch of people that like to play jokes the same way that you played a joke on me. <laughs> Here's what I think happened. The cowboys at the bar hoaxed 
these travelers. They did it because they were bored. We also learned at Boot Hill Cemetery from the funny headstones that we saw that people here in Dodge City have a very unusual sense of humor. Here's what I think happened. The cowboys at the bar that night, they sent the travelers over to the haunted house. It was dark and spooky. Then those cowboys went in the back door. One of them put a bed sheet on, or even they, or even put Mrs. McGinty's white dress on. And then went out into the darkness pretending to be a ghost. The skeleton that they said they saw standing in the corner of the room, I think they brought in a skeleton from Boot Hill Cemetery, which was right behind there. They swung and got a skeleton out and had jangled it around. And the ball of floating orange light it was obviously just a cowboy with a lantern in the background, waving it around and doing this. I think that's what happened. And you know what? I wouldn't have solved this case without you. If you hadn't decided to, to uh, scare me out of my wits, I don't know that we would have solved this case. We would have been baffled this whole time. So, anyway, thank you for helping me. Just don't think about taking those potato chips again, hey, bud. Hey, hey, I've learned my lesson on the potato chip thing. And to make it up to you, I am going to make it up to you. I'm going to share my uh, onion rings. I, 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 the works. I'm going, to, I'm going to share my french fries with you. Oh my, my goodness, I thought you said you were getting a small steak. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? That's enormous. That, how, what are you going to do with that? I'm going to share oh, You it. wouldn't know what to do with that. <laughs> oh, I'm fine here. I have a hamburger. People always ask me, Tom, what's the perfect cowboy food? This, <laughs> and I tell them, you're a cowboy. Hamburgers and french fries. Too. So, hey, this has been quite a weekend here, hasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. That's what I wanted. Everyone knows that that is the premier cowboy food. I just wanted to have a shot. <laughs> Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way but to act that each tomorrow finds us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God overhead. Lives of great men remind us we can make our lives sublime. And departing, leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. Foot and light-hearted, I take to the open road. Healthy, free, the world before me. The long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Henceforth, I ask not good fortune. I myself am good fortune. Henceforth, I whimper no more, postpone no more. Need nothing. Done with indoor complaints, libraries, querulous criticisms. Strong and content, I travel the open road. Alons to that which is endless, as it was beginningless. To undergo much tramps of days, rests of nights. To know the universe itself as a road. As many roads. As roads for traveling souls.